continuing our study in the Gospel of Matthew. Going to be teaching from the end of chapter 9, 9 uh, verses 35 all the way to chapter 10 to verse 4. Uh, the title of my message tonight is More Like Jesus. So if you have your Bible with you, please open that up right now and, and then also join me as I say a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much for this privilege now to be in your word. And Father God, I pray that as we're in your word, we will get a glimpse into your heart. And being in your presence, Father God, we pray that you will transform our hearts, transform our lives, heal us, strengthen us, build us up in you, Father God. Father, we want to look more like Jesus, and so we pray that you would just reign over this time. And Father, that we would leave tonight, Father God, having been strengthened and built up, our cup overflowing because we've been in your presence, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen, amen and amen. Maybe you've noticed, first impressions matter. Have you noticed that? I mean, our culture is big on making great first impressions. In fact, there's whole industries that are devoted to making us look better and feel younger. You know, looking for that magic thing, that fountain of youth for the new and improved version of ourselves, right? We see it all over. Maybe you haven't noticed, but I'm bald. Okay? Just wanted to break that to you right now. And you know, the funny thing is, is in high school, I was voted best hair my senior year. So God really has a great sense of humor, okay? And, and often I get asked by people to see pictures of what I look like with hair. And I'm happy to share with you that the wait is over. <laughs> what do you think? Right? I'm ready for my own show on the Food Network, wouldn't you agree? I put it on for my daughter today and she goes, no, daddy, get that thing off your head, don't bring it home. I love it. You should have seen the look on the staff's eyes and their faces when I brought into the staff meeting on Tuesday, it was classic. You know, people want to have that new look, right? Oh, if I just had hair. If I just looked a little bit younger, a little nip here, a little tuck there, then everything would be better. I'm so glad God doesn't look at us that way. Amen? You know, 1 Samuel 16, verse 7, we're told that God had sent the prophet Samuel to the house of Jesse to anoint the next king. And he sees the oldest son, Eliab, and he says, surely this is the Lord's anointed. But then God corrected the prophet and said this, God sees, not as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. Oh, he may look like the king, but I'm looking for someone else, someone after my heart, his younger brother, David. You see, God looks at the heart, and the question for us tonight is, what does God see when he looks at our hearts? My prayer is he'll see more of Jesus, amen? And tonight we will study an important passage in Matthew where Jesus called the 12 of his disciples to be his apostles. Here we will discover what it means to look like more like Jesus. Beginning in verse 35 of Matthew 9, Jesus was going through all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. Seeing the people, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. Jesus summoned his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out 
and to heal every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. Now the names of the 12 apostles are these. The first, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, and James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. Now, when we come to Matthew chapter 8 and chapter 9, as we've been studying, Jesus had just finished his Sermon on the Mount. He's in the northern area of the Sea of Galilee in the town of Capernaum. And during the Sermon on the Mount, we've been highlighting this over and over again. The Israelites were under this system of religion where they were told that all that matters to God is outward conformance to the law. And Jesus comes onto the scene and he overturns all of it. He says, it doesn't matter the outward conformance. What matters is a transformed heart because of one's faith in Jesus Christ. That's what matters, and that's how you will enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, after the Sermon on the Mount, we're told that the crowds were amazed by Jesus' teaching because, according to Matthew 7, verse 29, he was teaching them as one having authority and not as their scribes. Then in Matthew chapter 8 and 9, we see that Jesus revealed his power and authority, literally his credentials for being Israel's Messiah and ours as well, by performing 10 miracles. You see, he spoke with authority, and then he revealed his power and authority over all of creation. Now at the end of Matthew 9, we see a transition in the gospel. Here, Matthew gave us a glimpse into our Savior's heart and who Jesus would use to spread the good news about the kingdom of heaven. Now, if you and I, and I believe we do, if we want to look more like Jesus, the first thing we discover about him is this. Jesus loves the lost. Jesus loves the lost, and every one of us should be breathing a heavy sigh of relief and rejoicing, because that's what we were before Christ, amen? But Jesus loves the lost. Matthew 9, 35 through 36, is a summary of the threefold ministry of Jesus Christ at this time. He was teaching in the synagogues, meaning he was explaining God's will to the children of Israel. He was proclaiming, number two, or preaching the gospel of the kingdom, basically an application of God's will because he preached with authority. And then number three, he was healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness, which was an illustration that the kingdom of God was at hand because Messiah was here and only Messiah could do such things. Making the lame to walk, the blind see, lepers cleansed, Messiah has come. And when we see what Jesus is doing here, we see that he ministered with purpose, with focus, with diligence. Why? Because Jesus is the shepherd our lost world needs. Jesus is the shepherd our lost world needs. Look at verse 36. Seeing the people, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. This word compassion is so powerful. It's used throughout the Gospels in reference to Jesus' heart. It speaks of a deep sympathy which results in showing kindness, of being gracious, of having pity or extending mercy. Here we see that when God has compassion, it always brings divine action. When God has compassion, divine benevolent action always follows. Why was he that way? The people were distressed. And this speaks of one who is harassed and suffers trouble from the hands of another. That was Israel. They were dispirited, which speaks of one who's helpless and bewildered, 
thrown down and demoralized because they have no leader and are, are, and are unable to care or defend themselves. And Israel at this point, they're in survival mode because they were vulnerable and defenseless. They were in a sorry state because they needed a true rescuer, a savior, a shepherd. Now they had shepherds, the Pharisees, but the Pharisees were like wolves in shepherd's clothing who preyed on the weak and devoured the helpless. In fact, these shepherds are described and warned about in Ezekiel 34, verses two through six. Look at this description of what Israel was going through at the hand of their shepherds. Son of man, God is saying to Ezekiel, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to those shepherds, thus says the Lord God, woe shepherds of Israel who have been feeding themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flock? You eat the fat and clothe yourselves with wool. You slaughter the fat sheep without feeding the flock. Those who are sickly, you have not strengthened. The diseased you have not healed. The broken you have not bound up. The scattered you have not brought back. Nor have you sought for the lost. But with force and with severity you have dominated them. They were scattered for a lack of a shepherd. And they became food for every beast of the field and were scattered. My flock wandered through all the mountains on, on, on every high hill. My flock was scattered over all the surface of the earth, and there was no one to search or seek for them. That's Israel. But there is a shepherd that God desires for his people, and God promised he would come from the line of David, Jesus, our Messiah. In the same chapter, Ezekiel continues in verse 23, then I will set over them one shepherd, my servant David, meaning one from the line of David, and he will feed them, and he will feed them himself. He's not gonna delegate it to someone else. He will feed them and be their shepherd. Now what's the big point here? The big point is this. God sees the condition of the world and his heart is touched with compassion because the truth is, all of us are shepherdless without Jesus, amen? We are all shepherdless without Jesus, but God is not sitting by and doing nothing. God is willing and able to do something about it, and he has in sending his son, Jesus Christ, so that the world might be reconciled to God, have hope in this world, have everlasting life, and have fullness of joy that comes from a relationship with God even now. The truth is, Jesus Christ is the shepherd that we all need. And that's why Jesus declared in John 10, 10 and 11, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Our world needs Jesus. Now, if God's heart is so moved, should we be moved too? I believe, as we look at verse 37 and 8, God would have our hearts be moved. You see, may our hearts be moved by what moves God. Notice what Jesus does here. He directed his disciples' attention to our world's need for a shepherd. He said, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. Now, a little bit of history is helpful here. In the Old Testament, the harvest is a reference to God's judgment in the last days. Joel 3, verse 13 says, put in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. 
Come tread, for the winepress is full. The vats overflow, for their wickedness is great. After 400 years of silence after the prophet Malachi, John the Baptist comes on the scene and he's proclaiming the same message, stating that Messiah would separate the wheat from the chaff when he established his kingdom. Matthew 3:12. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clear his threshing floor, and he will gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Now when I look at Christ's words here, he's directing the disciples to look at the harvest because it's plentiful. I see a sense of urgency. He looked at the lostness of our world and declared the harvest is plentiful, which means the hour of decision has come because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. There's this call to make a decision. Now is the hour. The reality is we don't know when Christ is going to return. Now is the hour. We do not know when our breath will be our last breath. Now is the time of decision. And this image of the harvest carries with it both a positive and negative promise. Positive, meaning that entrance into the kingdom is through faith in Jesus Christ. Those are the wheat but negative, that entrance into eternal suffering will be for those who reject Jesus Christ, the chaff. And Jesus declares here the workers are few, meaning more help was needed so that the world may know their shepherd has come. He's been doing the work, but he's ready to delegate the work out. He's ready to incorporate them into the work that he has come to do. And he says, I want you to beseech the Lord of the harvest. What does that word beseech mean? It means to urgently plead or beg. Well, why would I plead or beg? Because I look at what's going on in the world and my heart is moved by what moves God's heart, you see. I see the lostness of our world and it breaks my heart because it breaks our Father's heart. That's the idea. And he's speaking of Father God who is the Lord of the harvest. Why is he the Lord of the harvest? Because all creation belongs to him. And? He has set a time for judgment, meaning the harvest. And at the harvest, the wheat and the chaff will be separated and sent to their eternal destinies. And this is key, for we're workers in the harvest field. And when we proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ, a person's response reveals whether they're wheat or chaff. There's a harvest going on, you see. But we also need to see the heart of our Savior that, they, that our Father and our Savior don't want anyone to be lost. For God does not delight in the death of the wicked. Ezekiel 33 verse 11. God says, as I live, declares the Lord God, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that the wicked turn from his way and live. And listen to what he says next. Turn back. Turn back from your evil ways. Can you hear God saying, that's not where life's at. Here's where life is at. How much does this mean to Father God? He sent his son, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. You see, Jesus wanted his disciples and us to see the lostness of our world. That their hearts and our hearts may break over that which breaks his heart. That their hearts and our hearts may be moved by what moves our Father's heart. We look at what's going on in Portland right now. It's been in national news. Our world needs Jesus. And you know, I hear over and over again, there's studies how the Northwest is the least, least churched region in all of the country. What should be our response? Is that the way it's always going to be? 
Could it be that God wants us to affect change? But how does that happen? When our hearts are moved by what moves God's heart. And we see things completely different, you see. And he asked them to pray. Why? Because prayer doesn't change God. God never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. But it changes us. As Pastor Rich has shared, we are changed in the presence of a holy God. You see, when we pray, and maybe you've experienced this before, God moves on our hearts so that our hearts are moved by what moves him. He asked them to pray for more workers to be sent in the harvest field, and then guess what happens? In chapter 10, the ones who are praying are now being sent out. Isn't that interesting? God could do it all without their help. He doesn't need us, but he chooses to use us. Why? So that we may experience the joy of witnessing souls be born again. That we may be rewarded for doing the kingdom work. And that we may have a sense of purpose in this life. What a shame it would be for Christians to feel like I've got no purpose. God has called us to one of the greatest missions humankind has ever known. In fact, the most important one, to spread the good news of Jesus Christ that our lost world may know that there's a shepherd, a rescuer, and a savior, Jesus Christ. You see, what does God want to do through the church? He wants us to be so changed, so transformed, so much in God's presence that when we're meeting other people and people meet us, it's like they've met Jesus because they've met Jesus in us and through us. Think about that. That I'd be so close to the Lord that my interactions with them would touch them in a way where it's like Jesus has been there. Because he ha is, has been there. He's in us. We're a temple of the Holy Spirit and to have an impact on their lives. You know, as I mentioned during the announcements, we're gonna have the baptism service this Wednesday night. And it is literally one of the highlights for me when we have these baptism services. Always, without fail, people will come up to me who are getting baptized and say, I don't want to share my testimony because they're nervous about speaking in public. And, and I get that, you know? Who wants to get out there and share their story? But I encourage them, it's gonna be okay. God's gonna meet you there. He's gonna give you strength. He's gonna bless others through you. Inevitably, these people who are so afraid, once you get in a mic in their hand, you can't get the mic out of their hand oftentimes. And they just start sharing, and there's a strength that comes over them, why? Because the Spirit of God is moving in them and they're experiencing that, and they're communicating Jesus. People are meeting Jesus through them and their testimony. I remember a few years back, there was this man who was 95 years old who wanted to be baptized. I thought, this is gonna be great. Well, as I begin to talk with him, I come to find out he's really not saved. Well, small problem, you need to be saved before you get baptized. So I began to talk with him gently about coming to faith in Jesus Christ and pointing him to the gospel. And I'll never forget, he goes, I want to pray right now. I want to receive Jesus as my savior. I thought, great. So we prayed, he gave his testimony. People were applauding and rejoicing. 95 year old man being baptized in the baptism waters. And the body of Christ rejoiced. And six months later, he went home to be with his Savior. God wants to transform lives. It's a beautiful, powerful thing. And what we have is the good news of Jesus Christ, the most beautiful, precious message that's ever been shared, that God sent his son into the world to die on the cross for our sin, that all who believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. That's why Paul says in Romans 10, 15, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. You see, God has called us 
to be his ambassadors. And that's what we see in chapter 10, verses one through four. In chapter 10, Jesus gathered 12 of his disciples and sent them out to the lost sheep of Israel. He gave his authority to the 12 so that they may do what he had been doing. Now what's important here is to see this. Discipleship is the first step. In verse two, we read for the first time that the 12 were called apostles, which means one who is sent, usually one who is sent for a dignitary, okay? One who's supposed to represent the king. But before they were called apostles, they were first called disciples in verse one. You see, before Jesus sent them out, they must first become his disciples, which means one who is being taught. Now, this is more than just being a student. Listen, you can take classes over at PCC and be a student. That's not what a disciple is. It's much more than that. A disciple of Jesus Christ is someone who lives according to his teachings. You know, it's like when you go to the beach and you have these footprints in the sand, right? Well, Jesus is our leader and he makes these footprints in the sand, if I'm his disciple, I am putting my feet exactly where his feet have been. I am following Jesus. I'm not just knowing about the teaching. I'm applying the teaching to my life and I'm living according to it. Now this requires humility. It requires a teachable heart so that we recognize our need to be taught and our need to be transformed. A teachable heart desires to receive the Lord's instructions. Psalm 25, verse 14. The secret of the Lord is for those who fear him, and he will make them know his covenant. God wants to reveal, but we need to revere the Lord, have a humble, teachable heart. You see, God wants to send us out and make a difference in other people's lives, but before we can lead, we need to learn how to follow. If we try to instruct others too quickly, we may be of no help at all. I mean, think about this for a moment. Could you imagine what it may have been like if Peter or James and John, who were called the sons of thunder, had been sent out too early? There have been a lot of crispy critters all over the place, right? Jesus would have to do some cleaning up. 1 Timothy 5.22 says, Do not lay hands upon anyone too hastily and thereby share responsibility for the sins of others. Keep yourselves free from sin. Now, when Matthew, the tax collector, was called by Jesus, what did he do? Well, he invited his sinner friends to come and meet Jesus. He didn't presume to instruct them. For him, it was simple. They just needed to meet Jesus. Now, as we spend time with our Lord, and this is key, and I want to encourage everyone tonight, will you make room in your life for Jesus? If you want your heart transformed, will you be in the Word? If you want your life transformed, Will you turn off the telephone? Will you turn off the TV and just be quiet before the Lord? Because in his presence, our lives are changed. I don't know about you, sometimes it just gets so noisy out there. And I don't need the opinions of others. I just need to be alone with Jesus, amen? And all of a sudden, my heart is set right. Because sometimes, when I hear all that's going on and feel all the pressures of the world, my eyes feel cloudy. My heart feels heavy. But there's something about being in the presence of Jesus that clears my eyes and lifts my heart and renews my spirit. And what happens is, is we spend time with Jesus and then we begin to apply his teachings to our lives, we change, we mature. Our lives become more useful in the hands of our Savior. What do I mean by this? God is the one who qualifies the unqualified. 
Because you may be saying, well, I want to go, but I'm not qualified. Well, who is? We all start out in the same boat. There's no such thing as God's gift to creation, okay? There's only one, and that's Jesus Christ. We're not it. But he qualifies the unqualified. And when you look at the list of the apostles and know who they were when they were called, and then realize who they became, it's truly a story of radical transformation. And we all need that. We all need that radical transformation. But you know, there's criticisms out there that the world likes to level against Christianity. That Christianity is just a crutch for the weak. Have you heard that one before? It's just a crutch for the weak. And the underlying assumption here is this, that if you were just stronger, you wouldn't need Jesus. But here's the deal. Our problem isn't just weakness, it's sin, it's death. I don't need a crutch, I need a new heart. How about you? I, I need something much more than, than just a crutch to lean on. I need a heart transplant. That's what I need. And Jeremiah 17, 9 says, the heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? Well, God does, and that's why he promised the new covenant and that he would give us a new heart. Ezekiel 36, 26, moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh, praise God, and give you a heart of flesh. That's what we need. God today, give me a heart transplant. I need a different heart if I'm gonna look more like Jesus. Now the men who were called by Jesus, let's be honest, they weren't your first round draft picks from a world standpoint. Three of them we know a lot about. Three of them know, we know something about and actually six of them we really don't know anything about other than their, than their names were recorded in the Gospels. Peter, he was a fisherman and if you know anything about him, he had a foot-shaped mouth. I mean, he's always making mistakes. He's always saying the wrong thing. He even tried to correct Jesus. And what did Jesus say to him? Get behind me, Satan. Wow, that's a red flag there. He wasn't very good with the sword. Garden Gethsemane, he tries to protect Jesus. He misses and cuts off a man's ear. Jesus had to heal him. Jesus is always picking up after Peter here. He even denied the Lord three times. But Jesus reinstated him. He said, your name's Simon, but I'm gonna call you Peter the Rock. Why? Because God sees us not just for who we are, but who we will be because of him. He changes lives. James and John, they were brothers and they were called the sons of thunder. Why? Because they're traveling through Samaria and the people didn't receive Jesus. So what did they want to do? They wanted to call down fire from heaven. Okay? Wow, that's a great response. Just burn them all, Lord. Sodom and Gomorrah right here in Samaria. Let's just wipe the whole lot of them out. No pun intended there. Anyway, did you get that Sodom and Gomorrah lot? Come on, work with me people here. You can go back and watch the tape. You'll pick it up later. Anyway. Luke 9, 55 through 56, but Jesus turned and rebuked them and said, you do not know what kind of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And then Matthew mentions himself, and he says, the tax collector. And we've talked about him before. They were considered traitors to the Jews because they sided with Rome to tax the Jews, and they would add more to the tax so that they personally could profit at their brother's and sister's expense. Interestingly enough, then you have Simon the Zealot. Now, he was part of a group of patriots who actually plotted against Rome, who hated Rome. So can you imagine what it must have been like for Simon and Matthew to be together, a tax collector and a zealot? Yet Jesus called both of them. And with the exception of Judas Iscariot, these men were radically transformed into great 
men of God and used by God to make a difference in our world. They were called in the frailty of human weakness, but were changed in the presence of Jesus Christ. Why? Take heart, because God qualifies the unqualified and, frankly, even the disqualified. That's what God does. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1, 26 through 29, for consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong, and the base things of the world and the despised. God has chosen the things that are not so that he may nullify the things that are. Why? So that no man may boast before God. If we're gonna boast, let's boast in our Lord and the work that he does. Now, I'm so touched because here we know about half of them, but there's another half of them we know nothing about. We don't know anything about their works, their history, what they did after Jesus Christ ascended into heaven. But God knows. God knows their works, and he actually honored their faith for all eternity. And we see this in Revelation 21, verse 14, with the coming of the new Jerusalem. Notice this. And the wall of the city had 12 foundation stones. And on them were not the six names of those that we know about, the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Isn't that great? You know what? We may never have any books or articles written about us. People may not recognize the work that we're doing in secret unto the Lord, but our Father in heaven knows. And he will reward us for that. What a comfort we see here. You see, in closing, more workers are needed who have the Savior's heart, who want to be more like Jesus. And maybe you're with me tonight and feel as I do. Lord, change my heart. Lord, change my heart that I would see you differently, that I would see this world differently, that what moves your heart would move my heart. I want to be used of you. I want to hear you say, well done, my good and faithful servant, when I stand before you someday. Well, what is going to be necessary for that is this. We need to give an invitation to the Lord to look into our hearts and the freedom to move throughout our hearts to fine tune and adjust anything that needs to be adjusted so we can look more like Jesus. David put it this way in Psalm 139, verses 23 and 34, search me, O God. Will you make that your prayer? And know my heart, try me and know my anxious thoughts and see if there be any hurtful way in me and lead me in the everlasting way. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this time in your word. Father, we come before you, bumps and bruises, mistakes, strengths and weaknesses. My first prayer for us, Father God, is that you'd bring healing to any heart that needs healing. That you would refresh any heart that needs to be refreshed that you'd strengthen every heart that needs to be strengthened, Lord. We need more of you. Lord, we want to look more like Jesus. We want our hearts to be moved by what moves your heart. And Father God, we come before you tonight and even say, Lord, would you shake up our priorities? That we wouldn't look at studying your word or even spending time in prayer as something that's just important. Father, it would be like the air we breathe. Father, we can only go for so long without air. And the reality is, is we can't go very long without you either. And why would we? 
church with eyes closed and heads bowed. If you're here tonight and you're saying, Lord, change my heart. I wanna look more like Jesus. Forgive me of my sin. Remove any rough edges. Remove that heart of stone. Because I wanna be useful in the master's hand. Would you just raise your hand and declare that to the Lord? Lord, change my heart tonight. Change my heart. Remove the prejudice. Remove the anger. Fill it with your love, Lord. Father, will you minister? Will you bring healing? Will you bring transformation? Bring life in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said,